The Kef reference to Meta is a center channel, but can also be used standing upright as like a monitor style speaker. It costs approximately $59.99 US dollars for the one speaker. So it is not playing around when it comes to budget. This speaker was loaned to me by a viewer. Big shout out to that viewer and you all take the, uh, the time to make sure you leave him a thank you for sending this in. Now, the reason I wanted to review this speaker right after the paradigm is because I wanted to show you what a more ideal center channel speaker looks like in terms of just pure measurements, okay? Now, keeping that in mind, this speaker costs about two times the price of that paradigm. However, I have reviewed other more cost-friendly center channel speakers in the past, and I will try to remember to link to some of those shortly. And then I've got another center channel that's coming in soon, and maybe another one. I'm trying to get a hold of one of those Martin Logan two and a half way speakers, so. But with all of that said, let me just go ahead and kind of give you the bottom line up front. For the cons, there are a couple little nitpicky things about the overall tonality of the speaker. The top end has a little bit of a roll off above about 8K, so it's gonna have a little bit of lack of maybe detail, lack of air, because I typically find that when people talk about detail or resolution, what they're talking about is a boosted top end. Now, luckily with this speaker, it has such low distortion, such a low compression, at least in the higher frequency region, and it has such great directivity that you can just EQ this up. The same thing goes for there's a mild dip around 1K. It might take out some of the attack. It might sound a little bit recessed. It could sound a little bit warm, just depending on the terms that you use to apply to these kind of sounds. Now, in this review, I'm also gonna provide you with some sound clips using zero degrees directly on axis and then 30 degrees off axis to the side. And before I do all of that, I'm just gonna show you a quick reminder of what I mean when I say on axis versus off axis and black is the on axis, red and teal are off axis and red is typically what I would recommend for off axis angling where it's towed out away from the listening position, firing straight out into the room. Let's knock out some specs real fast while I show you a quick video. This is a three-way sealed enclosure. It features a coaxial driver with the one inch aluminum dome tweeter in the middle and a five inch aluminum cone mid-range driver. The base units are two six and a half inch aluminum cone drivers. Frequency range is spec'd at 65 Hertz to 45 kilohertz, even though we can't hear anywhere near that high, but hey, that's fine, whatever. Crossover frequency is 450 Hertz from the mid-range to the mid-base and 2.1 kilohertz between the mid-range and the tweeter. Amplifier requirements are 50 to 300 watts. The speaker comes in a variety of colors and here's just three that I grabbed real fast to show you. This center channel would work really well for something like maybe you have a pair of the blades and you want a center channel and it doesn't match the aesthetic, but you can get a color that kind of goes along with it. Also, if you have the reference three or reference five metas, this also makes a really good fit for those as well. Now I reviewed the reference one meta a couple years ago, still one of the best bookshelf speakers I've ever heard. Still one of the best bookshelf speakers I've ever personally reviewed. It's a fantastic speaker. So I was hoping that this particular center channel would provide some of the same similarities as the Reference One Meta bookshelf. And by all accounts, it does. So going to the pros, it has very low distortion, really good linearity, reasonable sensitivity at roughly 87 or 89 decibels. And the most important thing, at least if I have to wait these for a multi-seat home theater, it has extremely good dispersion characteristics. Now, it doesn't radiate very, very wide like some standard, maybe two-way or three-way speakers that have a dome tweeter on a flat baffle. Usually those radiate about 10 to 20 degrees wider, but the problem is they don't hold that radiation pattern consistently. So there's definitely gonna be suck out regions through the upper mid-range area where that crossover is. And then when you get above about 8K, the tweeter starts to narrow up really fast. Now with Kef's coaxials, and then some other brands have good coaxials as well that do this, you don't have that suck out between crossovers and you tend to have a pretty uniform directivity, meaning that the sound that is coming directly at you is very similar in tonal profile to the sound that goes off axis. And in this particular case of using a center channel for a multi-seat home theater, this is extremely important. The purpose of a center channel is to provide you anchoring for the dialogue. But if you have multiple seats, so you have people sitting off to the side or maybe even a row behind you, 
You want them to have the same experience as you do, at, at least within reason, right? What you don't want is for you to have one sound and then them over here struggle to hear the dialogue because there's a huge suck out in the crossover region, or there's a major tonality shift between seat to seat. Luckily, this particular speaker does not have that issue at all. So it radiates consistently about 50 degrees wide and tall. And that also gives you the benefit of having somebody to sit behind you and hear roughly the same tonality that you're hearing. So with multiple row seating, you typically have to worry about not only just your head blocking it, but then the higher they are above that reference axis, which is typically the tweeter, they're gonna hear less and less mid-range and lower treble. And then when they get to the point of about, again, maybe 8K or so, they hear less and less treble. You're not gonna have that issue with this particular center channel. When it comes to bass output, I typically like to have about half an octave or so of overlap capability between the mains and the subwoofer. Now, most people target around 80 Hertz crossover. The lower the mains can go, and in this particular case, the center channel can go, the better, because let's say that you set up your subwoofer and there's a suck out at 70 Hertz, okay? And there's nothing you can do about that if you cross your mains over at 80 Hertz and the subwoofer's playing up into that region and it's diving like a cliff. If your mains can cross over down to 70 or even 60 Hertz, then you've got enough overlap to make up for that issue with the subwoofer. Now, using a subwoofer allows you to clean up the mid bass and the mid range from your mains by taking the stress off of those mains. So it's not just a matter of the frequency response extending low, but it's a matter of the frequency response and output capability to get low and achieve a certain level, okay? So in this particular case, again, the center channel seems to have really no issues doing that too. Now, with all of that subjective said, I'm gonna go ahead and play you the sound clips, let you hear what the tonality is on and off axis, and then we're gonna look at some of the data. Okay, now let's look at the data and see how that compares to what you just heard. On axis frequency response is pretty tight window within about maybe two and a half to two decibels. It looks pretty good through here. Average sensitivity is about 88 decibels, F3 76 Hertz, F10 at 46 Hertz. So even though this speaker rolls off a little bit early at around 76 Hertz, it doesn't hit its F10 point until 46 Hertz, which basically just means that it's a gradual roll off. This is a sealed enclosure, it's a gradual roll off. In the upper frequency region, you've got a little bit of a bump in the mid range compared to the mid bass area. Now this right here makes me think that you could probably place this speaker a little bit closer to a wall. And I would say maybe within about two feet. If you bring it further out from the wall, you're probably gonna notice that there's this little bit of a dip right through here. Now, that being said, that's only about uh, one and a half decibels. So it's not gonna be a night and day difference but it is something that you should keep in mind when you look at your setup. This right here is the 1K Hertz dip that I was talking about. And then if you look at the higher frequency, you can see where it starts to roll off a little bit early. Now let's look at the CTA 2034 data set, similar to what you just saw before with the on axis response and the listening window. But I wanna point out the directivity down here. This speaker has excellent directivity. Now the more linear this dash blue line is, the more EQable the speaker is. So for example, let's say that we wanna work on this dip right through here around 1K because maybe it sounds, uh, maybe a little bit too rest, recessed for us, okay? So we're gonna EQ this up. You can do that with this particular speaker. Now, if this speaker showed a big dip and a peak right through this region, where that 1K Hertz dip is, then you would not be able to equalize that because essentially that just means that the direct sound is different from the off axis sound, which means that the reflections would sound different than what you hear directly at the speaker, okay? And then going higher up in frequency, the mid-range to tweeter crossover is about 2.1K and there's no deviation. The handoff between the crossover from the mid-range to the tweeter and the speaker is excellent. And the handover between the mid-bass drivers to the mid-range coaxial driver is also excellent. This is the estimated interim response and a line indicating how I heard this. Bass extension, I say about 60 Hertz in room, placement dependent, but in an anechoic chamber with this kind of roll off, 
I would say 60 hertz will still give you that bass thump that you want. Personally, it would be cool if it would go lower, but that's what they had that big, huge, what is it, the reference for center channel for, if you want to check that one out. Uh, there is this mild upper mid-range scoop that I said earlier could sound recessed or warm. And then note the higher frequency roll off. Again, this may need to be boosted up via EQ. If you want to, you may actually like this kind of sound, but it's something worth noting. Uh, down here, I pointed out excellence response matching on axis and 30 degrees. So between this black on axis and this red 30 degrees off axis, these two just track each other pretty dang well. They're within about a decibel, two decibels or so. There's not a lot of shift, in other words, between the different angles. So that means that the seat to seat variation is gonna be pretty minimal. There is a slight ringing or decay ringing in about the three to four K area. And then also you round 1.5 K. Now these are pretty low in level. I don't know how audible they're gonna be. And before I go any further, I wanna note that a lot of people will say, well, aluminum drivers ring and, and that's what that is. Uh, go back and look at all the other non-aluminum drivers that I've reviewed and look at how bad some of the decay times are on some of those, okay? So it's not just aluminum, it can, it can happen with anything. Horizontal polar, looking down, bird's eye view, we can see that this speaker has really broad dispersion angles, okay? So typically most multi-seat home theater type setups, the side listeners are anywhere from about 15 to 20 degrees, and if you have a tighter window. So if you're closer to the speaker, then you may go out to 30 degrees, but for the most part, 20 degrees is kind of like where most people say that they're listening off to the side. And in that case, if you look, the red is just well within coverage. I mean, you're easily out to about 40 degrees up into about 13 K. So you got a lot of wide range window here, but what about vertical? If you have multiple rows, is the person in the back going to hear the same thing you're hearing? Or is there going to be a huge dip in the mid range because now they're going further away from that tweeter axis where everything is supposed to sound great, right? And in this case, yeah, dude, you got plenty of room. 40 degrees plus or minus, you're wide open. So you got plenty of room for somebody in the back row to hear very similar to what you're hearing. Another way of looking at it, contour plot, again, plus or minus about 50 degrees in the mid range, and then vertical about 50 degrees, which I noted wider than usual. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. This is incredibly low, incredibly low. What about multi-tone distortion? Also incredible. Just, it's, this is really good. And then if you cross it over at 80 hertz, what do you get? This, I'm gonna go back to full range and then back to 80 hertz. So if you cross over 80 hertz, you save a little bit of distortion in this mid-range area, but it's pretty much the same way either way. What about long-term compression? This is the same noise that I use from a multi-tone testing. It's like a pink noise type sound. And this runs for about 30 seconds, stepping from 70 decibels to 78 to 88 to 96. And then we compare the compression that way. At the highest output of 96 decibels, you're within about a half a decibel at most at around 100 hertz. Very good long-term compression. But short-term compression shows an issue. So instantaneous dynamic range this indicates to me that you're gonna to wanna to cross the speaker over at around 50 Hertz, definitely no lower, but that should be plenty of wiggle room for you to attach a subwoofer to your system. And I'm not saying that regardless of the subwoofer, you should cross this over at 50 Hertz. What I'm saying is that the minimum, maybe 50 Hertz, but this allows you plenty of wiggle room, like I was talking about earlier, if you want to cross that subwoofer down a little bit lower than 80 Hertz, or if you still wanna cross it at 80, you can do that as well. And then finally, the impedance. This indicates that this speaker may be a bit of a current hog for class AB amplifiers because it dips down to about 2.1 ohm in terms of EPDR at 200 hertz. But for most digital amplifiers, the actual minimum impedance value is what dictates that. So 3.2 ohm, in other words, get you a good four ohm capable amplifier. And then that does it for this review. I wanna again thank the gentleman who loaned the speaker to me. It's a fantastic speaker with a few little cons, but I mean, we're really picking nits here. If if this is something you're shopping for, look no further, go ahead and buy this center channel, call it a day, pair it with your reference five or reference three metas. I would do that in a heartbeat. It's awesome. It's expensive, but you're definitely paying for a better product in this particular case, which is a lot better than I can say for many other speakers that I've reviewed in the past. Okay. so. If you like what you see here, please take the time, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe, do all that cool stuff that helps with the algorithm. Comment, just say, hey, Aaron, um, you're looking extra healthy today. I don't know, just say something, but make it nice. That would be cool. You know, more positivity, always a good thing. 
Uh, you can just say my socks are awesome, even though you haven't seen them. Just it's it's a nice thing to say. Okay. <laughs> um, also, if you'd like to join me at Patreon.com, you can support what I'm doing. Patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I post polls there. That's how I decided I was going to review this speaker first today instead of the Moondrop M4P. That'll be coming very soon. And then you can also use any of my generic affiliate links if you just like to help me out. You can let's say you're going to go buy something from Amazon today. You're going to buy a back scratcher. Click my generic affiliate link. It'll take you to Amazon. Type in back scratcher. Buy your back scratcher. It doesn't matter what it is. It's appreciated. It earns me a small commission no matter what. And with that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.